to go back uh, to come back to Europe. Um, so this talk is going to be about sampling and uh, we're going to talk about the SK model. So Andrea talked about optimization and the next question in this program, the next natural question is about sampling. So can we do this for the SK model? And so this is the SK model. I don't need to really remind you, but uh, this, this is the notation. Um, so we have another that is that takes this form, so I cannot point by like this, it takes this form and the matrix M is the Gaussian entries of the symmetry and this is the, the temperature parameter beta. Right. And of course also something that I did not, that I do not need to remind you is that there's a phase transition at beta equals one where below one the model is at high temperature, overlaps concentrate around zero, Z is given by the annealed expression, and for a low temperature beta larger than one, the overlaps do not converge to any, to any specific uh, deterministic number. They have a distribution. It's the Parisi measure that Tuka uh, told us about this morning. The free energy converges to the Parisi formula, and the structure has been described in detail by Elihan this morning. And the question I'll be interested in is, can we approximately sample from the SK measure in polynomial time? So this is an algorithmic question, and let me go back perhaps to the setting. What is the input to the algorithm? The algorithm sees M. Okay, I give you M, and I ask you to produce a sample on the hypercube that is close uh, to the measure mu in law in some distance that I will specify. Are there any questions about the setup? This is the question that I'm interested in. Okay. So I've been told that the phys for the physicists, this question is trivial. You just run Monte Carlo and then you wait uh, long enough. But I hope uh, the mathematics will be interesting enough for the mathematicians in the room. Um, good, okay. Let me go back. So the first thing that you can try to do is global dynamics. Um, you start from a uniform configuration. Every time you sample one coordinate at random and you try to update that coordinate. Um, uh, corresponding or but via it's the conditional distribution you fix everybody except the ith coordinates and this is an easy thing because this is just an external field or a cavity field uh, that, that is introduced here so this is a simple step and then you update that uh, coordinates in this way and okay so each step is easy but you would like to know whether this Markov chain mixes quickly and to answer that question I'll introduce a spectral notion which is or a, a functional inequality that is called the Poincaré inequality. So we're going to say that a measure mu satisfies a Poincaré inequality if for every function f on the hypercube, the variance of f under mu is bounded by 1 over gamma times the Dirichlet form evaluated at f and f for some uh, constant gamma. So these are the definitions of the variance in the Dirichlet form. This is really just the variance. And the Dirichlet form is given by this. So it's some kind of... Uh, energy of the gradient squared, right? So the gradient here is in this notion. So if yeah. sigma you subtracts the expectation of f by holding all the coordinates but one fixed. And what is the relationship to mixing? This is a standard lemma that says if f satisfies a Poincaré inequality with constant gamma, then Glover dynamics will mix after n over gamma steps. Okay, so here it's interesting, this, this thing is interesting for gammas that are not too small, right? So that the mixing time is not too big. And ideally, if you can prove that gamma is positive, then you're fine, so you mix in linear time, right? So what is the state of the art on this question? There's a theorem by Eldan, Kora, and Zaytuni, offer Zaytuni, he's in, he's, he's in the room, that says that Mu satisfies a Poincaré inequality with this constant gamma that is given by 1 minus capital delta. Delta is just the spectral diameter of the matrix, okay? The largest eigenvalue minus the minimal eigenvalue. Okay, since my matrix is GOE, then the spectral diameter is 4 beta. That's just the semicircle law, the diameter of the semicircle law dilated by beta, okay? And you want this quantity to be positive, so beta has to be smaller than 1 fourth. And the proof uses a reduction, very clever reduction to a rank one model using this thing that, I, that, that is called stochastic localization that I will expand on a bit later. And this reduction is very clever. It's a very interesting reduction. 
So what does rank one model mean? It means that the interaction matrix in the Hamiltonian is a rank one, it's just UU transpose. And for those type of models, they're Curie-Weiss models as we know them. And for those models, the Debrusian condition is tight. Okay, so we exploit that fact. But now we would like to go from the SK model to this rank one model in a way that is monotone in a certain sense, that everything is preserved, the inequalities go in the right direction. The Debrusian condition is what? Say that again. The Debruchian condition. What, what, ah, is the, what is the Debruchian condition? The Debruchian condition is a condition uh, about Excuse measures me. that will ensure uh, spectral gaps. So it's a condition. Okay. I, I did not write it on the slides, and it will tell you, I, make, I can explain it to you a bit later. Uh, it's the standard thing that you can use to prove mixing at high temperature, but it doesn't work at low temperature. Uh, okay. What's the critical temperature in your normalization? Uh, beta equals one. Yeah. So here you do things correctly at one fourth, right? So you have uh, mixing up to one fourth. Yeah. Of course, okay. So I think everybody would uh, suspect that uh, the conjecture, the reasonable conjecture, is that you should have linear time mixing of two beta equals one, so the critical temperature. But this is still open. We don't know how to prove it. So I want to change gears and not talk about Markov chains for the rest of this talk. I will talk about other ways of doing sampling. And the first one is given by this very nice observation by Bauer, Schmidt, and Bodino that produces a decomposition of the measure mu into a mixture. OK, it's, it's a decomposition into a mixture of uh, product measures. And the theorem says that you can decompose the SK measure in this form, where you have measures mu that are really just product measures. They're just external fields. And the external field is drawn from a mixin measure M that is itself log concave. So this measure is on the real on Rn. So this is a measure on the hypercube. This is a measure on Rn. And this measure on external fields is strongly log concave for all beta smaller than one fourth. So for the same regime where Offer's result works, this theorem also works. Okay. But then if I tell you a result like this and I give you a description of M, the algorithm is obvious, right? What you do, you sample an external field from M using Langevin dynamics, and that mixes because you have strong low concavity. And then once you get M, then you sample from this, and this is just a product, right? So the algorithm is obvious if you know such a thing. And perhaps I want to do the proof of this because it's really nice. It's a few lines of computation, that's it. And it seems that this has been not been known until 2019, which is uh, crazy. Um, okay, so let's do the proof. So we're on the hypercube, and we have a quadratic form in the exponent, in the Hamiltonian. So we can add any diagonal without affecting anything. The diagonal is, uh, you know, sigma squared equals one. You can add a diagonal. In particular, I can add delta times identity so that I can shift this entire spectrum to the right so that the smallest eigenvalue becomes positive, right? So my m now is positive, but then it's upper bounded by c times i, but c is four times beta, right? I pushed everything to the right. Now m is positive, suppose this is strictly positive, I can add an epsilon, and then I can invert m. So m has an inverse, and the inverse of m is, is greater than c inverse. So there exists a matrix b such that this holds, right? b positive, such that this holds. Okay, so what is the point of this manipulation? Now I have, this is a Gaussian mm -hmm. form. I can decompose it into a convolution between a Gaussian with this covariance and a Gaussian with this covariance, right? Great. So now I'll consider this joint measure over sigmas and external fields, phi, that takes exactly this form. And mu zero is the uniform measure. Phi is just the Lebesgue, okay? And by construction, I know that a marginal over phi, so if I just take, uh, if I marginalize over phi, I get sigma, I get mu. So this is the SK measure. Now we can look at the conditional given a particular phi. So this goes away. Sigma squared goes away. Phi squared goes away. And then the only thing that matters is phi times sigma. So that's a product measure. And then I can look at the marginal over phi, so I can sum over sigmas, I'll marginalize over sigma here. And then I can, so this is a quadratic term, and I can, I have to just deal with this thing, and then I can do some manipulation, simple manipulations to get a potential that is separable here, right? 
And this potential is really just log cosh, so this is not surprising. So this thing is convex, but this thing is concave with a minus. This is a positive semi-definite form. So when is this measure log concave? It's log concave when this term wins. So there's a, you know, they're fighting against each other. So I need to look at the curvature of each one and compare the curvatures. The curvature of this one is at least C because B is positive. The curvature of this one, so this is a diagonal, the Hessian is diagonal. And I take two derivatives here, I get a C squared times one minus TH squared, right? So it's always smaller than C squared. So you want this to win, you want C to be larger than C squared. Okay? C is four beta, which means that beta has to be smaller than one fourth. Okay? So this is the proof, right? So it's a one page. Okay? But this only works up to one fourth, and I would like to go up to one. So what do I do? Okay, so let me show you the results. The result says that, so this is, I just copy pasted this from the, from the paper. Uh, for all epsilon and all beta smaller than one half instead of one, there exists a randomized algorithm which takes it, it inputs beta and a. So, okay, so I changed notation m equals, in my previous notation, m equals beta a. Okay, so this is just GOE without beta in it. So you take the disorder matrix as input, you output a point, a random point that has this law such that you're close with the distance epsilon within this in distance epsilon in the Wasserstein distance. And notice the normalization here. So these are vectors of size n. So I have to normalize to make everything uh, of order one. Okay? The runtime is polynomial in n and one over epsilon. So after we um, published this paper, we talked to a postdoc at Berkeley, Michael Celentano. And we told him where our proof breaks, and he knew how to fix it for all beta. So the result holds for all beta, smaller than one. Are there the same algorithm? Same, same algorithm. Just the analysis is fixed. Yeah. So I'll tell you where the improvement comes from at the end of the talk. Are there any questions about the, the results? So, so the, proof of, the proof of this goes by the method that you said before, or different? Uh, it doesn't use it as a proof, it uses it as, a, as an algorithm. Yeah, and I'll talk about this. Okay, let me do this. Okay, so the result relies on a discretization of the SL process, not as a proof, but as an algorithm. Okay, so let me introduce what this is. So you have a measure mu on Rn. It could be on Rn, it doesn't have to be on the hypercube. Okay, this is due to what I have done, this construction. And I want to construct a measure value to process mu t for all times t, so it's indexed by the real line that has the following properties. This is the construction, I should say. Um, I'm gonna consider these things that are called exponential tilts. And this is just a tilt of my measure mu with this uh, exponential, okay? So it's y times x minus t times x squared over 2. For any y, I introduce a y and I construct this measure. Right? And I'm going to call m comma t y to be the mean of that measure. Now I'm going to make yt evolve. I'm going to make yt evolve in the following SDE. So an increment in yt is proportional to the mean in the drift plus Brownian motion. So this is a way to make the external field evolve, right? And that gives me a family of measures. So my measure mu t is the measure mu t sub, okay, mu sub t comma y t. So this one with a y t here. And this measure is called the stochastically localized measure at time t. Are there any questions about the construction? Do you have just an intuition on what is mu t supposed to represent here? Yes, I will tell you that. Um, yes, I will tell you that. Just bear with me for a little bit. So what are the properties of this, uh, of this, of this process? It turns out that it's a martingale. In particular, so this is a random measure. And it's a martingale as a measure, as a measure-valued process. In particular, mu is always the expectation of the mu t's. So this is always a decomposition of mu. So these mu t's form always a decomposition of mu. Right. 
Also, these measures collapse in the sense that their covariance goes down with time. So the covariance will collapse to zero as time grows. So these measures, you can think of them at time zero, it's the SK measure, or whatever measure you started with, and as you're evolving, the measure shrinks like this. Okay. And you're evolving in a random direction, the measure keeps shrinking. Up to collapse, it collapses at the end. Okay. And the collapse is given by this third statement, and it's really a consequence of the first two statements, is that this mean vector mt, which is really the mean of mu t, it's a martingale, so it'll converge if everything's bounded. And this, it converges to a point m sub infinity that is itself random and drawn from the original measure. Okay, so this is a consequence of these two. You can try to think about it. It's exactly really a consequence of these two statements. So we're gonna exploit these statements to form an algorithm. In particular, if you can compute these MTs at every time, then you can just wait long enough for you to get at something that approximately is uh, distributed according to the original measure. Okay, so naively, okay, so let's discretize this thing. So given an external field at any time L of this iteration, you want to compute this mean vector of this stochastically localized measure mu sub y. And I'm going to call that approximation m hat. Now, OK, so we update the field in this way. Once you compute m hat, you update the field by sending it to be the uh, former field plus uh, some, you know, so a drift that is proportional to the mean that you just computed plus Gaussian noise. So this is the obvious discretization. Okay, and you wait long enough and you, up so you update, you up output as an algorithm, you output m hat for uh, a long, long, large enough, and then you would like to know whether this, this thing works. In particular, whether this disc discretization converges to the continuum PSDE. If you can show that as you let delta go to zero, everything's fine, then you really sampled from your measure at the end, right? Are there any questions? So the main difficulty here, so let me go back. The main difficulty, so this is an obvious thing to do, but the main difficulty is to compute an approximation of the mean. So the main, the main crux of the method is really to compute an approximation. Right, so we need to compute approximations m hat, that which are sufficiently accurate and regular. What do I mean by that? So first of all, approximation means that you're approximately close to the, 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 the mean vector for any field y, or for any typical field y. You're close enough. And the second one, which is a bit more subtle, is that you want this map for any field, the thing that your output, that your algorithm is outputting, has to be Lipschitz uniformly in the approximation error. So why is this? Because you would like your SDE, your discretization of your SDE, to converge as the step size goes to zero. And the natural thing to ask for this discretization scheme is that it's Lipschitz, right? So that when you drive delta to zero, you get converges to the continuum limits, right? So this is the usual thing that you want. So this is, turns out to be very difficult to achieve. So that's the main thing. Here you can, okay, I'll show you the algorithm. Let me perhaps, uh, the algorithm has a two-stage um, nature to it. So the first stage is an approximate message passing algorithm. And the second one is something a bit more uh, accurate, let's say. It's uh, this uh, mirror descent algorithm on the top free energy. You try to optimize the top free energy. So let me tell you what these things are in more detail. So I think AMP, we've seen it in the, a few lectures by now, but this is a simple version of it. So you have two iterates, Z and M. Z is updated by taking the current M, multiplying it by the disorder matrix, adding a field, and subtracting an Onsager term. And then the next M is the hyperbolic tangents of Z. Okay. So this, says, this stage is interesting, is important because you can, so the M here is going to converge to the, to the actual magnetization. And you can exploit state evolution to prove many things about this. So this is what's nice about AMP, you can use state evolution. I'm sorry, uh, oh, is this with external field or without external field? With external field. So you, uh, but the mix of the... Uh, no, 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 no. The, the original measure does not have an external field. But now, since I'm, I'm introducing an external field by the stochastic localization, right? 
So that every time I have a YT that I need to, that I need to put here, right? every time. And I'm changing the external field at every step. Right? It's, like a, it's like a cavity field. It's, it is a cavity, sure, yes, it is a cavity field. Yeah, it is. Is it one external field for the whole system, or is it like was it several? No, so this is just one sub-loop of the algorithm. So you have an external loop of the algorithm that updates the field. And as a sub-loop, you have the computation of the mean vector that is associated to that external field. And I'm just looking at that subroutine right here. Right. Yeah. But it, so in, in the main algorithm, in each step, you have one external field for the whole system. It's not like yeah. several ones or a local one. Or it's no, no, just one external. But it's not uniform. It's an external field that is, uh, you know, the coordinates are not the same. Right. Yeah. Uh, good. Other questions? And so one thing that is, uh, that is exploited crucially in this algorithm, one has to show this, is that this lands in a strong region of convexity of the tap-free energy. So the tap-free energy is very irregular, and you want to get to the bottom of the landscape. You would like to get to the bottom, to the global minimum. And uh, okay, you don't know how to do that in general, but then you show that AMP will get you to a region of strong convexity around the global minimum. Once you do that, you can do use stage two, to really zone to home in on the on the global minimum and have obtain a higher accuracy solution, which is going to be looked with respect to y. Okay, so this is the main thing. So AMP, we do not know how to show it. It's looked with respect to y. So this, this iteration is not looked with respect to y. Or at least we don't know how to show it. But then with this algorithm, you can show that that's the case. And the condition to show that that's indeed the case is to show that the tap free energy is strongly convex around the minimizer. Could you just, just use stage two? No, because I don't know how to get to that region of strong convexity. So the landscape looks like, like this. But then you have to get me here, and then I, I'll do. Right. So AMP will get you here. So this approach, this two-stage approach, was, was uh, used by Michael Celentano, uh, Zhao Fan, and Song Mei for other reasons, for another paper of theirs. Okay, and now I want to talk about the analysis, if there are no more questions. So the, this is a description of the algorithm, and please let me know if the algorithm is not clear. So I, I don't understand intuitively why the algorithm works. Intuitively, why the algorithm works. Yeah, how it works. I mean, I, I agree the equations, but I... Yeah. At a high level, what is it really doing? Okay. So, uh, let me perhaps spend a few minutes on that. So maybe uh, another way to sample, which is more natural than this one, forget about global dynamics, is to order the coordinates x1 plus n, sample x1 according to its marginal, p1, then sample x2 according to its conditional distribution, given x1, dot, 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 up to xn, right? So this is a natural thing to do. Okay, you can try to analyze this. We don't know how to analyze this. And the main idea here is that you're revealing information step by step about the measure. You're localizing it, really. So if you look at the measure mu given the first i guys that you've seen so far in this project, process, this is also a stochastically localized measure but in a different sense. This is, you can consider this, you can think of this as being a localization scheme. Okay. So what do you need to do in this algorithm? You have to compute these things. Each one, you have to compute the marginals, right? So how do you compute the marginals? You can try many things, right? And this is, at the end, once you compute accurate enough approximations to these marginals, at the end, you have a sample from DSK measure, right? So on a high level, you're doing the same thing. Yeah? Except that the information that you're conditioning on is somewhat more complicated. It's not just revealing coordinates by coordinates. You're doing something a little bit more subtle. And perhaps I should jump into, maybe I'll show this in a few slides, but the information that you're conditioning on, if you want to put these two uh, strategies side by side, here you're conditioning on revealing the exact value of coordinate one, then coordinate two, then coordinate three. What you're doing here is you're revealing the information that is corrupted by Gaussian noise. So I draw a vector from the SK measure, I'll add Gaussian noise to it, and I'll show you that, okay? Now if I show you that, I ask you what is the conditional measure of SK given what I've showed you. I claim that that's the stochastic localization process, mu t, 
or mu sub y. And that's going to be a lemma that I'm going to show a bit later. Does this more or less? Uh... Uh, yeah. Is the next slide going to have the algorithm again? Or... No, so we're done with the algorithm. Well, I can come back later to the algorithm. Right, I don't know how to, how to map what you just said to the equations. I mean, what you said makes sense to high level? Or... So I'll, 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 each thing is in its own time. I'll, I'll be back to this remark. Other questions? Okay, so this is basically what I said. Um, there's another characterization of DSL process that takes this more con the, oh, sorry. <laughs> This is another characterization of the stochastic localization process that is two lines. Instead of writing an SDE, this is one way to characterize the SL process. First, you draw a point or a vector from your original measure mu, and then, as I said, you add Gaussian noise to it in this particular fashion. Okay, so yt is tx0 plus bt, bt being a Brownian motion. And then I give you the realization of y2, yt up to time t, and I ask you what is the conditional measure of x0 given the, given the observation. Okay, I'm going to call that yt, and I claim that this measure-valued process that I just constructed here is exactly the stochastic localization process. Okay. So maybe, perhaps now you can draw a parallel between this and that procedure. Here I reveal information that is corrupted by Gaussian noise instead of revealing coordinates by coordinates. And at every time, you need to compute something in this localization process, right? So here, I compute the marginals, and in this, in this setting, I'm computing the means, which are more or less the same thing. So the main thing is you want to compute the means, and since I'm giving you, so this is a statistics problem, really. So I give you information about something that you would like to recover, and so computing the means is really a base optimal reconstruction problem, right? So you're just considering you're trying to compute the posterior mean of some measure that you know. So in order to do this, we're going to introduce a planted model. So okay, so let me go back and uh, talk about computing the means. So you want to compute these means from this from this conditional measure. The problem is the prior. Okay, so mu x zero is drawn from a complicated measure mu, and I don't know how to do that. Okay, so that's the problem that I started with almost. I don't know how to do that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce a, another measure that is close, another ensemble that is close to this one, and analyze that. And that's simpler. So this is uh, this is the usual trick: you introduce a planted model. And this has been done many, many times in, in this field, and people in this in this room know about this. So let me introduce the model that I started with, which is the one I'm interested in. I sample A from a GO matrix, and I consider this stochastic localization external field Y T. And then I want to sample a point from this measure that is tilted by yt, right? So that's my random ensemble. So here I'm going to, in the planted model, I'm going to invert the sampling. Instead of sampling a, then y, then x, I'm going to first sample x, then a. So I'm going to sample x with respect to its marginals, which are uniform. Then, conditioned on x, a will be a shifted GOE. Right? I'm going to shift the geomatrix W by XX transpose. So that's a new matrix A. Okay. And now how do I construct YT? I'll just write YT equals TX0 plus BT, the same way I wrote it in the previous lemma, except that X0 doesn't come from the SK model anymore. It's just a uniform lemma vector. Right? Now, the equivalent line, the last two lines are equivalent of each other. I draw X from the measure that is conditioned on observing A and Y. Right? So this is my plan for the model. To be more specific, I'm going to let Q be the joint law of A and, the, and Y, here and here. And I'm going to let P be the joint law of A and Y according to this construction. Okay? So perhaps one remark that I should make is that the dependence between A and Y in this model is horribly complicated. Right? So this is the mean of this measure, and this measure involves A here. So this yt depends on a in a very weird way, right? Here, the dependence between a and y is very simple. It's just if you condition on x0, they're independent, right? So this is very useful for the proof. OK, this is OK. So you can prove this lemma via just a Gaussian computation, this Gersanov's theorem. The uh, likelihood ratio between p and q is the um, 
partition function of the DSK model with no field, with no field. So if beta is smaller than one, I know that P and Q are contiguous because this fluctuates at an order one. Right. So now instead of working with this complicated model, I'm gonna work on this model and then prove everything in this model and then go back at the end. So that's what I do. Still have uh, 15 minutes. Because we... I'm going very fast. Okay. Um, so I do the analysis in the planted model and now I want to show you where the beta smaller than one half comes from and how it's been uh, tackled. So the main problem, as I said, so A and P will give you a region of strong convexity or presumably strong convexity, but you still have to, pro to prove the strong convexity. So you want to show that A and P will get you to a region that is strongly convex, so the curvature has to be strictly positive. Uh, in a, some radius R0, around the iterates that is uh, produced by AMP. So I did not write what F tap is, but I do write the Hessian of F tap. It's this one, so it's minus beta A plus a diagonal that looks like this, plus beta squared, one minus Q identity. And you would like to show that this is strictly positive for all beta smaller than one. So this is not a trivial thing, but what, what is trivial is that this is true for all beta smaller than one half. Why is that? is because you can forget about this term, remove it. So this is positive, so it only helps. This matrix D is larger than one, or larger than the identity. So if beta is smaller than one half, identity minus beta A is positive. So that's positive, right? So we were lazy and we, we were content with just proving the results for beta smaller than one half. Uh, that's why, where the, the bottleneck comes from. Okay. But then if you try to do a more careful analysis, you can show that there is strong local convexity for all beta smaller than one. Okay. And so the argument, as I said, for beta smaller than one half is very simple. But then if you want to prove this, then you have to look at this. You, okay, so you look at this matrix, which is the Hessian, you multiply it on both sides by a vector, a fixed vector V. So that gets you a Gaussian process, right? It's a Gaussian process that is indexed by M. And what you want to show is that this Gaussian process is strictly positive for all beta smaller than one. So what you can try to do is do Gaussian comparison inequalities like Sudakov, Ferni, or Gordon, and try to analyze whatever the simpler Gaussian process is. But this doesn't always work. So you will not, you will not get to beta smaller than one uh, using this, that technique. What, however, what you can do, and this is inspired by some work of Erwin Bolthausen, is instead of looking at the Gaussian process as a whole, you can condition it on a certain sequence of sigma algebras. And that sequence of sigma algebras is given by the AMP iterates. So run AMP on this matrix A, that will give you a certain sequence, a sequence of vectors. You condition your Gaussian process on them. Since this is a linear operation, the conditioned Gaussian process is still Gaussian. And then you do sudakov fernik on that. Okay. Now, if you construct the AMP iterates correctly in a certain clever way, then you can show that that Gaussian process, the simplified Gaussian process, is strictly positive. Uh, yeah, with high probability. Um, what's, so the norm of MMAP squared is a norm of order n? The norm of what? Say it again. MAMP, the vector MAMP. It's Q times n, something. Yeah. And order R0? Uh, square root n. So t times square root n. So you're, you want to, so you're not looking, you're looking at a radius of order square root n, not very extensive, and that's what you want to show. No, not very extensive, but it's, it's of it's an extensive order, like small constant times extensive, or the size of this fold. I think you're right, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, R0 is extensive. I think you're right, yeah. I think you're right, yeah. Other questions? I can check more carefully. So that uh, more or less concludes, I think I am early. Um, that's more or less concludes the talk. So the sampling algorithm works up to the critical temperature. So now perhaps I can talk about, ah, we're not done yet. 
I want to talk about low temperature. So I showed you a result that works up to beta equals one, and that's a positive result. But then what happens at low temperature? Okay, so I'm gonna show that a certain class of algorithms cannot work for beta for larger than one. Um, and this really relies on the notion of chaos that I will introduce uh, soon. And uh, the notion of chaos go, or disorder chaos goes as follows. So I'm gonna construct an interpolation AS, A sub S of my original matrix A with an IID copy A prime. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is stability before talking about chaos. I'm gonna say that an algorithm is stable if when you apply it to A and then apply it to AS, then you look at the laws of the outputs and the distance between the laws of the outputs goes to zero as n goes to infinity, then this parameter s goes to zero. Okay, so it's kind of some kind of Lipschitzness, some kind of regular regularity. And the statement here is that the, theory, the, the algorithm that I just showed you, the, the description of that algorithm, is stable in this following sense, right? For all beta, not just for beta smaller than one, all beta, okay? So by the previous result, this is also true for SK, right? If I remove alg from here and I remove alg from here, this is still true, right? And this is, by the way, this is a stronger notion than uh, the, the results that we already know from, from the literature. This process type two is a natural post elastic local, localization framework? Yeah, this is just a natural uh, convenience uh, distance to work with, yeah. Um, I don't know how to record TV, that, that would be too much of a headache. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and now what is chaos? Um, I'm gonna define chaos in the following way, which is a stronger notion. We can prove that for all beta larger than one, when you take the SK measure with disorder A and the SK measure with disorder AS, and you look at their distance, that distance remained bounded from zero no matter what. Okay, you take n to infinity, then you take the least favorable s in this, in this uh, quantity, in this expression, that's still strictly positive. And this doesn't follow from the results of Shadrigy, for instance, if you take two, uh, two, uh, one replica from the original measure, a second replica from the perturbed measure, you take it at their overlap, you go to zero, then it doesn't follow from that. You have to, do, you have to really exploit replica symmetry break into, to, so this, the proof goes through the Parisi formula. Now you can see that you cannot sample, right? Because this, this contradicts this in the low temperature regime. Any stable algorithm has to have this, but then the measure you're trying to approximate does not satisfy this, right? So no stable algorithm can approximate the SK measure at low temperature. That's a negative result. Okay. Now you can ask me whether stable algorithms are, are all there is, right? Um, a lot of the algorithms that we use and know and love, they're all stable, so you can rule them out. So we have to come up with something that is not stable in order to sample from the SK measure. For instance, running perhaps global dynamics for a sub-exponential number of iterations that is super polynomial, that's not stable as far as I can tell, so perhaps that can do something. But running global dynamics for a fixed number of iterations or a linear number of iterations is stable, so you cannot use that, okay? Any questions about this results? Do you also have temperature stability? It'll Yes, so the algorithm is still, so we can define the same notion. Instead of perturbing A, you can perturb the temperature. The algorithm is also stable in this fashion. Therefore, the SK is also stable in that fashion. Yeah. But the algorithmic uh, implication really is, comes from disorder chaos, not temperature chaos. Yeah. Other questions? So, uh, I mean, since we have these algorithms now that can sample ground state if there's no over if, it, if you don't have a gap in the overlap, right? And I mean, this seems to be based partly on PAP, so with those algorithms, you can find the PAP solution that are the right ones if there's no overlap. Imagine. So, so optimization is easier than sampling. Sampling is a more brittle question. So it suffices that there is chaos. You don't have to talk about overlap gaps. Yeah. Suffices that there is chaos then the distribution will just, uh, you know, if you're trying to sample and if the distribution is sensitive to extremely small noise, there is no way you can capture the, the support of your measure. Um, but perhaps some other, perhaps to tie it to optimization, in optimization we care about errors that are linear in N, so the results that Andrea showed are 
you know, approximate ground states, approximate things that are you know, extensive error. And that's not enough to say that some, anything about the, the Gibbs measure. It's enough to say something about approximate ground states. But if I ask you the same question of optimization, but exact optimization, or maybe error that is square root n instead of n, then that problem is as hard as sampling. I mean, uh, this is morally, you know, I'm not proving anything here. Yeah. Sorry, I mean, so maybe it's more related to this question than actually what you showed, but so do we know if we can say something, perhaps I should have asked Andrea, about the distribution of the states reached by these optimization algorithms? Uh, at what temperature? Low low temperature when you're doing actual optimization. It's some weird thing, I think uh, it's... But we have no clear understanding. No, I don't, it's not the Gibbs measure for sure, because it would contribute yeah, to this. this. Yes. It's something, I don't know what it is, yeah. It's some weird thing that we don't understand, yeah. But that's a good question. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so let me try to conclude. Interesting directions. Um, I showed you an algorithm that samples from the SK measure without external field. So of course I'm constructing some external fields along the path, but those are very special and I can handle them. But then if you give me an arbitrary external field from the beginning, then I don't know what to do. The algorithm supposedly should still work, but then the proof breaks really bad because the contiguity breaks and I cannot introduce a planted model. And the second question is about P-spins. Can you generalize this to P-spins? This is easy to generalize at high temperature, high enough temperature, and you would like to push this up to the dynamical transition. And this, I think, should be done. This is not a problem. Um, OK, so if you're between condensation and dynamical, it is not believed that efficient sampling is possible. So can you show a lower bound against stable algorithms? And this, uh, this is an interesting regime because it's not a low temperature regime. This is still a high temperature regime. In particular, there is no chaos in this regime. So can you show a lower bound on algorithms that does not exploit chaos? Because there is no chaos, right? So this is an interesting question. This conceptual question that is interesting. So what happens to the measure so that you cannot sample from it? Of course, this is a big open problem, sampling the global dynamic mixes for all beta smaller than one. And finally, I would like to consider other disordered models that are not necessarily of the form that SK takes. For instance, the last two models are in finite dimensions, so other phenomena happen there. OK, let me stop here. Thank you. Uh, we had already a few questions during the talk, but uh, are there other questions, comments? Could, it, uh, could this also be applied to simulated annealing when the temperature changes with time? Or could, would, does this give any insights to analyze like changing temperature? That's a simple question. Uh, No, so simulated annealing, you would like to do it in a, ideally in a region of low temperature, right? You're taking the temperature to zero, right? But then I showed you that there's a barrier, right? You can do annealing up to the critical temperature, but I don't know if that's interesting, right? Yeah. Um, do you believe that the Poincaré inequality constant is well behaved up to the critical temperature? So beta large smaller than one, yes. That's my, I believe that. Uh, heuristically, you can you can you can see it, uh, but the proof is difficult. But at one, I don't know. No, at one, it will blow up for sure. But smaller than one, it should be okay. Yeah. That's it. I don't know if this really makes sense, but could you instead of doing gradient descent once you're in the well, use the uh, use the AMP to initialize well and then run globber? and use some like convexity property to say that the glob is fast from there? That's great, yeah, uh, good question. Uh, I thought about it. I couldn't come up with any reasonable uh, proof uh, for this. Um, yeah, so uh, perhaps uh, the question is, can you use this algorithm to give a very good start, a very good warm start to Glober, and then show that Glober works? That's a great question. I would love to, to show that, yeah. Okay. So that's. Okay.